happy to see you guys today and uh, I'm happy to share the word that God has placed in my heart um, even though it's one of the probably the hardest times I've ever had not preparing but just praying to um, that God gives me the the strength to deliver his anointing to deliver this so before we go on into into the sermon I'll definitely want us to um, get up and pray that God would anoint this place and every single person that's here and uh, cover us with his blessing and his spirit would fill our heart. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you are present in this place, that you were here before we came. My God, that you, uh, Holy Spirit, brought us here, but your tug that you placed into our hearts, that you... Uh, that you found a way, Jesus, to our hearts to bring us here, Lord. Maybe from a young age, Lord, you've been tugging on our hearts. Maybe we haven't been responding, my God. Or maybe we've been in church this whole time, my God, and been hearing your words, my God. But I pray today, Holy Spirit, the word that you've placed into my heart, let it be anointed with your presence. Let it be anointed with your anointing, Holy Spirit, so they would fall into our hearts like seeds, my God, that would produce fruit. 30, 60, and 100 fold. Holy Spirit, I pray for every single person here, my God. Holy Spirit, that you cover them. And any need they might have and any trouble that's on their heart, my God. Give them the peace, Holy Spirit, that Jesus promised. Jesus said, He gives peace not as the world gives, but as only God gives. Holy Spirit, I pray, my God, give us the heart to hear and the heart to understand. I pray in your holy name. Amen. Uh, so for the last, <clears throat> for the last few weeks, uh, we've been going over the sermon series, um, pretty much on receiving from God, right? Um, the series called God gave you and then whatever would follow, you know, it's a, it's something that we talk about when the, the, the process of God taking something into his holy hand, stretching it out. And given it to us. Now we as, as his children, as, as his church, we take that. Either we know or we don't. Right? We said God gives you time. We don't even, might not even think about it, but we're taking that time. And we, we're receiving that time. Now you're saying God gave you uh, uh, gifts, right? Jenya Benya was talking about God gave you gifts. Some of us know or some of us not, don't know it. Some of us take it, some of us don't even take that. Or, I mean, we have those gifts, but we don't even use what we've taken, right? So we were talking about these things, and um, today I believe um, I'll be talking about the, probably the best gift that God has ever given us is His Holy Spirit. And we know, you know, we have such a God that loves to give gifts. He really does. And even the Bible tells us in Matthew 7, 11, it says, if you then, though you are evil, admit it or not, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask Him? And He loves to stretch out His, hands and, uh, his hand and give us something. But the difference between people and God is that He gives gifts with a purpose. He never gives gifts just like that because it ruins people. A few years back, um, we had a family Christmas party, and uh, we we had a secret Santa, you know. And uh, we set a standard, right? We have uh, what forty dollars. Whoever you pull it out, you need to buy a gift for about forty dollars, right? You know, there's always that person that buys a gift for five dollars, and then you wait sixty, and it's like, how's this life fair? But um, we had a gift that we would um, need to buy for somebody else, just a normal gift. And then a, a separate gift would be called the funny gift. So you can spend a 10 cents for that or a dollar or however you want to, you know, how much, however uh, much amount of money you want to spend on it. You can't. It's up to you. But the point is that you ha it has to be funny. It has to relate to a person. It had to be funny. It, can be, it could have been anything, honestly. But after the party or opening of presents was over, I'll tell you, most of these funny gifts would go to waste. It had no point. It was just something to make, you know, people laugh. And there was no purpose to really use them for, right? There's, they had really no purpose at that time. Maybe somewhere they would have a purpose. But for that moment, 
didn't have a purpose. So most of them would just go to trash. Now, God has given us his Holy Spirit. And it's the most important gift we can receive living on this earth. And it is by His Holy Spirit that we're actually becoming part of His church, becoming part of His body. And it's by His Spirit that we're able to come to Him. So He gives us this, His Holy Spirit. And um, just a heads up for you guys, I, um, I'll try to cover what God has placed on my heart. There's definitely only going to be probably a drop, maybe half a drop, out of the whole entire ocean, ocean that I'm going to cover today. Because Holy Spirit is God. And there's, it's impossible to cover Him with you know, with our limited minds. But if you guys have uh, your Bibles uh, with you, please open at um, John chapter 13, verse 1. John chapter 13, verse 1. And um, I'm going to base the whole entire sermon pretty much on this uh, verse that I'm going to read. My, my main point that God has placed in my heart. And it says, uh, Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. I'll read it again. Jesus knew that the hour had come to, for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Now, the setting behind, what, behind this um, part of scripture is uh, his, the Last Supper. Right before we have communion Every single um, month we have, we have our pastors read over this verse in the Bible, right? This is the Last Supper, and Jesus is done preaching. He's done teaching. He's, uh, n he's done performing miracles in the crowds, and he is on his way out of this world, right? He's preparing to step into his last mission, and he was going to leave the world. So he's done ministering to the crowds and crowds of people. He's now preparing to do his the mission that he came actually on this earth to do. Now Jesus knew that he was about to leave this world. So he directed his words to those who were most dear to him. And it says his own. You know at that point he spoke. We know that the Bible tells us that it was pretty much his only disciples in the room where he's talking to them. The last supper he's talking to his disciples but he's directing these words to his own. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Now, he said he's not going to leave his own, right? And in, in, when we read in John 14, 18, Jesus spoke, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Now, who are his own? I want to cover that real quick because... Want us to really understand what he's talking about. His own are those people who have accepted him as Christ and Savior. Who has believed his words. It is you and I who believed him. Who uh, left our old life. Left our sins behind. And, and surrendered our lives to him. Right? We see the example is um, disciples. But talking about us as well. We, um, his own are the ones who left their sins. Who left their old lifestyle, who left their um, desires and surrendered to Christ. Now, when we see there's a story in the Bible where his biological brothers, biological his own, right? You would call them. Came to him when he was teaching in one of the houses and they came to him and they said, at that point pretty much ashamed of the reputation that he was been getting. And they came to the house and they said, they called somebody and they said, can you call Jesus to come out, please? We need to talk to him. And that person went inside the house and says, Jesus, there's your mother and your brothers that are calling you outside. And he said, who are my brothers and who is my mother? And the scripture tells us, those who have heard and obeyed the words of the Father. And Jesus spoke the words of the Father. So those who obeyed and heard and obeyed the words of, of Jesus were his own. Now my question to you is, are you his? Because when we are, we can say it, I mean, out loud to ourselves, sometimes even we're stepping our heart, right? And we can say, yeah, we are Christ. We're part of his body. 
But if we truly say, are we his own in the way where we have accepted his words and obeyed his words? And this is a question that I want to speak to you as well. I want to ask you is that, are you his? Because if you are, he has a promise for you. He says, I will never leave you as orphans. You know, he said, one of the first things I want to put out, he says, I will never leave you. When I was uh, on a missionary trip along with Nick and, uh, and Mark and a uh, number of girls, we were on a missionary trip, trip for uh, after Bible school. So I'm just, I just want to encourage you, whoever is going to Bible school, commit yourself to a missionary trip. Go for a trip. Allow, allow God to use you in that way. Step out of your comfort zone. You'll just see how God can use you. But going back, we were on a missionary trip, and uh, we had a few trips to the war zone. Um, whoever doesn't know, there's a war going on between, you know, Russia and Ukraine on the border. And uh, we had a chance to go to the, to the war zone. And we were coming back one time after we unloaded all of, the, all of the food and passed it around to the refugees. And we were coming back home, and we, um, on two different vans, it was Nick and I driving in one van, and my, my dad and Mark was I were driving the other van, and we saw we we saw um, a military vehicle that was broken down on the side of the street. Uh, the wheel just completely collapsed, and there was a bunch of soldiers on the side of the road that were standing there. So we, my dad pulled over and he said, "You guys need a lift? Anything?" Um, they said, "Yeah, if you guys are going that direction, we'll definitely you know jump in in the back. Even though it's those are cargo vans, we're gonna jump in as long as you guys can." take us to our military station. So Nick jumped in the back with the guys, and, and two of the main guys, um, they're, they're uh, I don't know their position or ranking, but they were sitting, they sat right next to me, and we had about a three-hour drive that we, uh, ahead of us. So we started talking, and uh, you know, I had a lot of questions. Back when I was, uh, when I was uh, um, a lot younger, I really wanted to go to Army. You know, my dad would tell me all these stories about Army, and... Um, uh, you know, the life in the army, and I really wanted to go, but it never turned out, and I, I praise God that I never went to, to the army. Um, but I, I was asking him all these questions, and I, and I asked him this one question. I said, aren't you guys excited uh, coming back home? Because they got their vacation time with, uh, for their families. I said, aren't you guys excited to come back home after, you know, seeing all the evil things going on, seeing all the death around you, knowing that, you know, a bullet can catch you around the corner. Aren't you excited to go back home into the comfort of home, into safety, you know, next to your children and, um, you know, in, in, in a place of peace? And he said, yeah, we are. I said, but I'll tell you, most of these guys, after a week, they're going to come back to the military station and say, take me back to our guys. So the reason to that is because these guys are going and understanding. At this point, they're excited. But when a little bit of time passes, he said, and I've had it before. When a little bit of time passes, people understand that they are their own fighting still. And, said, and they have this something tugging on them. And they would literally, they would ditch their homes. And they would come to a military station and says, I can't. I can't do it. It's bothering me. They're my own guys, my own friends. They're fighting for this country. I need to go to. I can't be in safety. I was honestly surprised to hear that because I thought, you know, people would mostly run away from those places. I've never, I never thought I was going to hear that. Play, that. Um, and the point that I want to see is, this is a, these are old guys, older guys. These are army men, right? These are soldiers. And when a group of these soldiers are leaving to, into a safety, into a place of peace, into a place where their families are, they know that there's some people left behind that are fighting. And they said, I can't leave them like that. Now, when Jesus was leaving this earth, he says, I will not leave you as well. I'm going into a comfort of heaven, into a pr place of praise and honor for me. But I will never leave you. I'm not going to leave you. And look at the interesting part about this is that Jesus is saying, I will never leave you as orphans. You know, I, um, 
really thank God pretty much every day that I've never had a chance to be an orphan in my life. I've never lived through that. Um, but I have a few family members that we have adopted into our family that back in the day lost their parents. And they were orphans. And they were in the foster homes. And uh, before the sermon, I've, I've called my sister. That I called my sister now. And I, and I asked her, can I tell you, can I share your story? It's something that I've never lived to, but I've seen your, I've seen you, you know, for, I've known you for long enough. You're my sister now. Can I share the story? She said, you can share the story for God's glory. I want to tell the story of, a, of what it feels to be an orphan. Because Jesus points out that I will never leave you as, not as soldiers fighting while I'm coming back from my church. I'm not going to leave you as parents over something, uh, over your children that know how to take care of themselves and of their children. I'm not going to leave you as someone that's, you know, mature enough. He said, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. Understanding that without Christ, we're going to be orphans. And orphans can't protect themselves. They don't have protection around them. They don't have anybody to provide for them. They're on their own stuck. They're pretty much predestined for ruin. When my sister was nine years old, she lived with her, um, with her dad and her mom in one of the villages in Ukraine. And uh, her mom used to drink a lot. Her dad as well, but not as much. Her mom used to drink to a point where she had this psych psychological thing going on. She had this, um, something clicked in her head. If you really translate what they call it, it's literally a squirrel. Bielichka. <laughs> I don't know if you guys know what that is. It's a person who begins to, you know, a person that begins to not be in his own mind anymore. He begins to see things. He begins to act weird. Pretty much a person that that's, um, doesn't control himself anymore because of his uh, drinking habits. So her mom had that. And whenever um, they would go to sleep, her dad would always carry, uh, hold an axe under the pillow every single time. Because of the things she used to do, right? She would get up. She can get. She could have get up with a knife and just start swinging around to do whatever she wanted to do. And um, he would always sleep with a with an axe under the pillow, and my sister would sleep next to them. I was right there. And uh, one night, my sister woke up. She was nine years old. She woke up because it was very cold that night, and she woke up. She realized that she didn't have a blanket on her. So she, said, she got up and she walked around to try to look where the blanket go because she wouldn't just sleep with the blanket on. And she walks into the kitchen after walking pretty much most of the house. She walks into the kitchen and she sees her mom laying on the floor. And she ran up to her and, you know, started shaking her. She, you know, shook her up a little bit and her mom didn't respond. She looked at the face and the face was all blue. And apparently her mom stabbed herself to death. And this girl, nine years old, she began to cry, even though she told me, Alex, you know, my mom didn't show me mother's love. She was always drinking. I've never felt mother's love. And I um, said, but I was just scared. And I began to cry, and I began to, um, I didn't know what to do. And then her dad came from work, and he just took her by hand, took her away from mom. They went to a police station. And uh, after they investigated a little bit, they blamed the murder on her, her dad. And they took him away to prison. And at nine years old, my sister ended up completely on her own. Completely on her own. And she said, Alex, I just, you know, I would just get up in the morning. I would run around, do whatever. And I would come back home. The, 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 the house was completely empty. Things were locked. She said, Think people did not care about me at all. I was nine years old. Said I was, you know, in in her this uh, all over the place. She she didn't have anybody to take care of her. She didn't have anybody to look after her. You know, uh, I have a few nephews, and some of them are older than nine years old. You're afraid to even let them out on the street nowadays with a bicycle. But at nine years old, she was completely, completely alone. She didn't have anybody. She didn't have a grandma, a grandpa. Anybody, she was just out there in the streets on her own at nine years old. That's an orphan. When Jesus was leaving this earth, he said, I'm not going to leave you guys as orphans. 
Because without me, you will be like that. There's going to be no one that's going to give you a hand. There's going to be no one that's going to protect you. There's going to be no one that's going to provide for you. I want you guys to really ponder on that. And when Jesus was leaving, he said, I will come to you. Now, we know that Jesus ascended into heaven. He ascended into heaven, and the scripture tells us that he's now at the right hand of God. He's sitting on the throne at the right hand of God. In Luke twenty two sixty nine. 69, it says, but from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the mighty God. And Jesus was speaking of that. Now think about it. When we think of soldiers that, you know, are old enough to protect themselves, they have the weapons in, in their hands. They're old enough. They may be wise enough or smart enough to find a way out of things. He's not saying, I'm going to leave you like soldiers. He's not gonna, he didn't say that I'm going to leave you as, like older people. You are all adults. He said, I'm not going to leave you like orphans. I really want you guys to think about that. Holy Spirit has been stirring my heart about it for a while. And he said, I'm going to come back to you. Now, how is he going to come back to us when Jesus is sitting at the right throne of, right hand of God? He said, I will send you a helper. I will send you my spirit, Holy Spirit. And when you accept me into, my, into your heart, you'll, you'll receive the Holy Spirit. Now, there's different things that people have different uh, opinions on this theologically. If you're baptized in the Holy Spirit or receive the Holy Spirit. But we know one thing biblically is that we are united into the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 9 says, You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. Now, who is this Holy Spirit that we're talking about? The most important gift a human being can ever receive living on this earth. You know, there's many books that are written on, on the Holy Spirit. I've, I've finished one yesterday written by Billy Graham. It's a pretty thick book. There's a lot, a lot to cover. There's a lot of things people, people write about, theologians. There's many different classes that you can take on studying the Holy Spirit. There's many different sermons out there to study the Holy Spirit. I'm, and what I know is that that's only a small little jug of water that you can take out of the whole entire ocean. Holy Spirit is God. And this is what Scripture tells us. Holy Spirit is God. He's the third person of the Trinity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Whenever we pray this at the end of our you know, Sunday services or whatever... We say in Russian, but we say these words, May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Written in 2 Corinthians 13.8. Now, how, if you say, how can there be three, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, if there's only one God? And with human words, with human wisdom, we can't really explain that much. But I'll tell you just the best example probably people have been using to explain that is that when you take water, H2O, right? You have the liquid water, you can have ice, and then you can have vapor, but that's all H2O. Or you take the skin, the seed, and the meat of the apple, but it's one apple. Or you take the yolk, the white part, and the, and the um, shell, makes up one egg. And of course, it's very simple to say this, and people might say, well, that's, you know, that's a weird example, but that's true. And if we try to understand God to the fullest with our unlimited mind, mind how can we call him God? He's way beyond um, our understanding. Now, Holy Spirit has different names. We call him teacher, instructor, director, or leader. John 14, 26, it says, But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all the things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Now, he's also our advocate the one that intercedes for us that guards us the one that stands up to us john 60, 16 7 says but very truly i tell you it is for your good that i'm going away unless i go away the advocate will not come to you but if i go i will send him to you in john chapter 14 verses 15 and 16 it says if you love me keep my commands and i will ask the father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, 
the Spirit of truth. Now, Holy Spirit is not only a helper and an advocate, He's also the one that convicts us of our sin. Because people sometimes think, you know, I'm convicting of sin. They, they mess it up with condemnation. It's two different things. The Bible tells us, 2 Corinthians 7.10, 7, it says, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. In John chapter 16, verse 8, it says, When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. Now, one day we're in the world and God, you know, by the power of the Holy Spirit convicted us of that. And we understand that we're in need of a Savior. We come to the cross and through Jesus Christ, we would receive the reconciliation with the Father. Now, He's not a force. How many people understand it? And they say, it, when they're talking about the Holy Spirit, it's not an it, it's a He. He's a person. He has his own personality separate from the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Whenever people are getting baptized and we have baptisms going on there, you know, from different churches, people come here to the pool. We have baptisms um, every May and uh, every fall. And whenever a person is getting baptized, they said, in the, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I baptize you. So we are being baptized in the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And when we read 2 Corinthians, as we already read 13, 14, it says, May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Now, he also has feelings. He can rejoice. <clears throat> he can be happy. He brings us peace. But he can also be grieved and quenched by Christians. Ephesians 4, 30, it says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit with whom you are sealed of the day of redemption. And what, do you, what does it mean to grieve? Whenever we sin, whenever we mess up, whenever we stumble, we grieve the Holy Spirit. Now, it's separate from, um, it's separate from, from blasphemy. It's not the same thing. It's grieving. It's really bringing a little bit of hurt. And we, uh, the First Thessalonians 5, uh, 5.19 it also says, Do not quench the Spirit. What does it mean to quench the Spirit? Is that when Holy Spirit is tugging on your heart and you push it off. Holy Spirit begins to tug you somewhere or to do something or spend time with you and you push it off. You quench it. You quench what Holy Spirit wants to do within you. It's like trying to, you know, it's, it's a little bit like pouring out water over, over a fire. Quenching it. Now, I want to cover quickly on blasphemy of the Holy Spirit and I want to try to be as careful with this as possible but I believe blasphemy on the Holy Spirit is one of the biggest tools the devil tries to use sometimes against Christians. When I was a little kid for a very long time I was praying to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and I was afraid that I'm going to blaspheme the Holy Spirit and I was so afraid to, um, to be seeking you know, to be baptized in the Holy, uh, to be baptized and, and speak in tongues. You know, and uh, but after uh, after a while, after I went to Bible school, after I went to Bible school, throughout this whole time for many years and years and years, people would pray with me even before um, we received water baptism. Pastors would pray, and I was so afraid I would just wouldn't allow because I was afraid to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. And then during Bible school, I remember. Um, we were praying one time and there were no pastors, no, there, was, there was nobody else, just a group of, of people. Pretty much the whole Bible school got together and we were praying. And um, people started, out, started coming out to the front and, you know, praying for each other. And I remember I was standing in the front by myself and I was praying on my knees and this just brokenness be came before God. And all of a sudden I felt that somebody was standing on their knees right next to me and a hand just went on my shoulder. And as soon as that hand touched me, I began speaking in tongues. This person was Slavik Yusinski. I remember I was like, dude, you should be a pastor. <laughs> pastor. Pastors prayed for me and nothing happened. I was like, you got some anointing on you. But even then, you still begin to, devil begins to send you these thoughts. You probably blasphemed the Holy Spirit. You probably did this and it, and it, and it hinders us. It hinders us from uh, serving God. And a lot of people 
I know people start, uh, share their stories, their testimonies with me, how they were so afraid that they blasphemed the Holy Spirit, that they were, you know, they were afraid. They, they didn't even know if they should go to church anymore. You know, if you're afraid that you blasphemed the Holy Spirit in your thoughts, or maybe there was a moment where you tried to pray in th- tongues, and you thought that you blasphemed the Holy Spirit, and the devil is using that against you. Trust me, if you have those warnings in you, or, or these feelings in you, that's the first sign that you haven't blasphemed the Holy Spirit. If you have conviction in your heart, and if you have this tug in your heart, that's the first thing that will tell you that you haven't blasphemed on the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to read a few passages. I want us to to really think about it as well, because I know the devil has been using for some of you, using this for some of you guys as a big hindrance. Luke twelve ten it says, and everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, Jesus Christ. Will not be for, will be forgiven, but anyone who blasphemes against the Holy against the Holy Spirit will will not be forgiven. Now the second uh, verse that I want to read is John six thirty six. It says, "All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never drive away." Now, what about a person that grieved the Holy? I mean, blasphemed the Holy Spirit. What if that person comes to God? Will he, will he drive them away? Exactly. Because a person that has blasphemed the Holy Spirit, he will never come to God. He will never find the need to come to God. He will never be, he will never be convicted and he will never find the need in the Savior. Therefore, he's never going to come to God. And this is something to be afraid of as well. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3, it says, Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus, be cursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So it is Holy Spirit that brings us into maybe even through conviction brings us to Christ. And through Him we can receive salvation. Through Him we have eternal life. Through Him we're not rejected. So therefore if Holy Spirit is tugging on your heart and even warning you of some things, don't don't push it off. Don't push it off. Because it's a very good sign the Holy Spirit is doing His work in your heart. And that's a very good thing that's going on. Accept it. Take it. If Holy Spirit is tugging in your heart to leave your ways, leave your sins, do it. Because that's the tug of the Holy Spirit. And by rejecting it many times, we know that's written about in the Bible as well, that their hearts were hardened. And Holy Spirit would step away from those people. And those people would never find the need in the Savior anymore. They would never be tugged by the Holy Spirit anymore. And they would step away never to come back to Christ. Because you can't repent unless you understand that you are a sinner in the need of a Savior. And the work of the Holy Spirit is to tell you that, that you're in the need of a Savior. John 6, 8 says, when he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. So we know that's the work of the Holy Spirit. So if you guys were... um, you know, in a moment, in a season in your life that maybe you are right now, that your devil is using that against you to tell you, well, you've already probably blasphemed the Holy Spirit. There's no salvation for you. Give up on what you're trying to do. I tell you, if you're already having that, don't listen to the voice of the devil. Rebuke him in the name of Jesus, and he will flee. This is, But if you're getting convicted, and if you're getting that stuck in your heart, don't push it off. Don't iron your consciousness out. Take it, bring it to Christ, surrender yourself to Him, confess your sins, let go of them, and He will accept you, He will take you, and He will use you in, uh, in His will that He's predestined for you personally. Now, why did He give us the Holy Spirit? He's given us such, a, such an amazing gift, His own self, into our own hearts. Why would He? To comfort us, to teach us, to um, purify us. We know that the, the work of Jesus Christ on this earth was to come into this world, to preach the word of God, to go on the cross and by his sacrifice bring salvation into for humans. That was the work of Jesus Christ, to bring salvation. And it is through, only through Jesus Christ we have salvation. It is only, He is only the way, the truth, and the life. It is through Jesus Christ. But the, uh, when Jesus has died on the cross and went and ascended into heaven and sat at the right throne of, uh, right hand of God, 
Holy Spirit came here to this earth and His work began. His work of pruning, His work of cleansing us, His work of um, purifying us as people. And, and, and being able to bring us into, into uh, uh, purity so we, can, so we can glorify God through our lives. Because the main point of Holy Spirit on this earth is to, is to glorify Christ. But my point is that what can we do in this world without the Holy Spirit? Nothing. You know, I've, I've, we had a chance with um, Nick as well, with some other guys. We had a chance to visit. Um, we just went out into San Francisco and we just walked the streets a little bit. And we tried to spend some time reaching out to people that are hopeless, that are in the streets, that live in the streets, and that are... Um, you know, they're rejected by people. You go into, you, you come up to these people and they already know that what you th- probably think of I me, mean, they already know that. Right. So we came, we came to uh, San Francisco and we're just walking around, we're passing, it, passing some food around, trying to pray for people, you know, talking to them, talking to them. And after, after a while, you know, we got rejected by some people. People definitely said some, I don't need anything. I'll just take a food, but I don't need no prayer. I don't need no church. I don't need any of what you guys have to offer. You know, and after a whole day of walking around, we're just tired. And I, we just sat in the car. And a lot of us were just sitting there because when we walk the streets, we've seen people shooting up, shooting heroin into their, under their knees, you know, it's in the middle of the street how, you know, these deals, drug deals are going on and everything. We walked through the streets and we were just completely blown away of what is going on in this world. And we sat in the car after and said, what can we do? You know, many people, young or old or even very old, they think they have wisdom. Or even us as youth, we think we have wisdom. We think we have the strength. We think we have the abilities or the energy to do some things. There's nothing that we can do in this world without the power of the Holy Spirit living in us. You know, I was on my, little, on my trip that I went to uh, Minnesota. I was talking to a guy that came with me. It was actually Eddie's brother. Uh, he came from Washington. And we were just sitting in the hotel after the meeting. And we were just talking about the things that are going on at this point in this world. You guys have been hearing about the laws that have been passing, passed around, passed, and how other states are just jumping at it as well and just trying to go even farther than that. And you see, look at all these things we're just kind of thinking, and it's, it's, it's hard to even grasp that this is actually happening. How in the world have, you know, how, how do we come to this place? You know, and I was, um, after we've, we've talked, I was just this, Bird and I was just driving in the, in a in a, a taxi that took me to the airport, and I was just walking through the airport. I still had some time and this burden in my heart, and I was just praying over it. Praying, I was like, Lord, how in the world is this happening? Where is your church at? Where are we as Christians? Where are we at? We see all these things going on. Where? Why don't we see the church doing some things that the world looks at and says, What is going on there? What are they doing? You know, when I was walking around, and I, I've walked through a little stand. It's a bar stand, and people are just drinking on the spot. It's not even food. It's just, it's just drinks. People are just uh, drinking there and watching, you know, sports, whatever. And right next to it, not even a wall separating, was a little store, and the Christian song was playing. I said, it's interesting, but the tug that I got Holy Spirit speaking to my heart is, Sometimes that's the only thing we are doing as Christians. It's turning on some Christian music. We can't do anything without the power of the Holy Spirit. When we realize these things, I tell you as young people, Jesus, for some reason, he invited very young people into his ministry, right? And they understood these young people were so strong in their own words. Peter, take a uh, look at Apostle Peter confidence that he had you know the the you know maybe the wisdom that he probably had right even though the father would reveal the things to him and it wasn't from himself but the understanding that he had within him was like I'm able to do some things but when the time came of testing and the time came where his words were actually tested against him he realized that he can fail really really easy 
And to be honest, I believe at this point, as, as not as entire church, but many different churches, many different churches, many different people in their lives, all they can do against the sin that's going on in this world at this point, greater than probably ever has been, is just turn on some Christian music. There's really no power in the things that they do. And there's really no power or an anointing in the words that they say. Why? Because Jesus, it's interesting because Jesus said, you will receive power when you will receive the Holy Spirit, right? You'll receive power. Now we've received the Holy Spirit and some of us are even speaking in tongues. But where is that power at? And I'm thinking about it and like, you know, where did it go? The Holy Spirit is still with us. I know as, as my personal life beginning to examine it is that I'm not giving him to, the room to show his power. I have plenty of confidence in my own self. I'm a young guy. I have opportunities and all that stuff. Who needs the Holy Spirit? Now many of us, we, we understand, we acknowledge that we need the Holy Spirit in every day of our lives. We need the Holy Spirit to overcome it. We need the, the Holy Spirit to restore our personal lives. Our families, how many families need restoration now? Our communities, our churches, and all these things, we understand that we need restoration. We need the power of the Holy Spirit, but we don't give the room for the Holy Spirit to move. We're not ready to accept Him into our lives. Because when the Holy Spirit comes, He doesn't take 90% of your life. He doesn't even take 99% of your life. He wants 100% of your life. And if, we, and, and if we are not willing to give that up, we end up um, trying to do things on our, by ourselves, on our own. We need the Holy Spirit. We can try to attempt to live a holy life, to live a godly life. We, we can try to attempt to restore some things, our relationships, our families, or, you know, get rid of our habits, or have an impact on our neighbors, have an impact on our church, have an impact on the world around us. But if we don't have the power of the Holy Spirit, all we are are orphans. We don't have the power. We don't have the strength. It is by the power of the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, it will be a miserable defeat and disappointment if we take it with our own strength and wisdom. I want to point out something that Billy Graham wrote in his book, and it just kind of underline the power of the Holy Spirit, the importance of the Holy Spirit into our, in our lives. He says this, the God-man, who is Jesus, was begotten by the Spirit, written in Luke 1.35, baptized by the Spirit, John 1.32-33, led by the Spirit, Luke 4.1, anointed by the Spirit, Luke 4.18, Acts 10.38, and empowered by the Spirit, Matthew 12.27. He offered himself as an atonement for sin by the Spirit, Hebrews 9.14, was raised by the Spirit, Romans 8, 11, and gave commandments by the Spirit. But that's Jesus, the Son of a living God. Now every step of the way is being marked by the power of the Holy Spirit in his life. And then when Jesus was thinking and said, I'll give you the same power, you'll do greater things than I did. Not by your strength, but the, but the Spirit that was in me. That's the only way you can do it. If the Holy Spirit that would live in you and you give him the room, he's going to perform even greater things. Now how can we think that we can have it all together or even anything together without the power of the Holy Spirit? No, the Holy Spirit can purify us. He'll prepare us for eternal life. He'll, he'll give us strength. He'll give us strength to face any demonic forces any temptations, any strongholds. But his main power is to, I mean, his main goal on this earth is to glorify Christ. Now we as this church, that's our goal as well, is to glorify Christ. Now we take these things together and you understand it. We all understand it. I'm pretty sure we're sitting here together, we all understand it. But what should we do to actually make it happen now? Because we've seen in our lives, I don't know about you guys, but I've had seasons in my life, in my life where I've tried to be better by myself. And I'll come to a disappointment once, and I'll come to disappointment a second time, and I'll be going on and on and on, and I understood that I need a stronger, somebody stronger than I am to help me overcome it. 
No, one time and during Sunday service, I was praying um, during worship, and I was praying, the Holy Spirit so strongly spoke into my, my heart, and He said, Alex, I will fight your battles. And people, who needs the Holy Spirit now to fight their battles? Who is in need of Holy Spirit to take over their lives and just take him through the seasons that they're going to understand that Jesus, I can't do it on my, uh, by myself. Holy Spirit, I need you to take me and fight my battles. But it's not only Holy Spirit taking and fighting our battles the way, the way we are. It's also for us to surrendering ourselves. Because if we fight, he fights our battles, but we keep on living our own ways, our own desires. And surrendering to our own wills is going to be really not that much use. Do we need him now? You know, young people, I believe that. And this time I'm looking around and I know usually older people say, man, there's so much evil in this world. There's so much evil in this world. I think as young people, we under begin to understand it ourselves. There's just way too much evil out there in the world. And if we don't have the power of the Holy Spirit within us, we're going to be like those orphans. Without the protection, we're going to be failing the way we're failing. We're going to be weak the way we would be weak by ourselves. If we don't give the power of the Holy Spirit. If we don't, have, if we don't give the space for the Holy Spirit. You know, I was thinking about these you know, new laws that are going on. And give it a year or two ago, we would probably think that it would be barbaric to do the things that they're doing right now. Now, if we're at this point, we understand the devil takes usually people farther than they wanted to be to go, you know, into a deeper sin that they ever wanted to go. If we see the things that are going on right now and babies are being slaughtered and things around us, it, it's, it becomes a norm. Who doesn't promise us there comes a time when they're going to think that the people who declare Christ as their Lord and Savior are not worthy to live on this earth? At this point, we say that we're, in, we're living in such a country, it's impossible for things like this to happen. Impossible. I tell you, young people, everything is possible. But it's also possible for us as Christians, for us as believers, if we give the space for the Holy Spirit, because if we have accepted Christ into our lives, Holy Spirit lives in us. But He can't use the power that He has within Him if we don't have the space. How can we in our lives, if we don't spend the time in the, whole, in the presence of the Holy Spirit, in, in His Word, how can he, we have the strength that is promised in this Word if we don't even realize that the promise is there? But if we give Him the space, if we give Him the time, if we surrender not our only battles, but our victories, but our good times, you'll begin to see they can use it in such powerful ways that the testimonies that you heard of somebody else's life will begin to happen in your life. The strength that will come to your life that you heard of only before. You know, when Jesus walked this earth with his uh, disciples and John's disciples came to him and it says that they asked him, why don't, disciple, why don't the disciples fast? Because we're fasting and Pharisees are fasting. And Jesus says, well, the groom is with them. They're not going to be, they're not fasting right now because the groom is with them. Well, once the groom leaves, they're, they're going to fast. And for me at this time, I'm thinking, man, now we should probably fast and cry because we don't have, we don't give the place for the Holy Spirit to move in our lives. It needs to raise up a cry within our hearts. Young people, God has created you in your mother's womb. His will is for you to have the power of the Holy Spirit. His will is for His church to be alive. For His, for his will is for the world around us to see His church. And they say they have something so powerful within them. What is it? I want that. But if we don't, have the, if we don't give the space for the Holy Spirit to move within us, we don't spend our time with Him. We don't give ourselves to Him in the ways that He desires. How can He move within us? 
then the world doesn't even notice the church around themselves. But his will is for you. Since he has created you. Since he has planned things out for your personal life. It's for you to live in the power. And anointing on the spirit. And not to live as an orphan. You know, I was talking to my sister. I was really surprised that she didn't, how to say it, didn't break a tear when she was talking about her experience. You know, for me, when I was thinking about it, I had some tears rolling down my eyes. But there's something that happened in her life, the things that she used, that she lived through, it's like they were erased. She says, I have glimpses. I, I see these glimpses, you know, of my life back in the day of being an orphan. How many of us wants that life to be behind us? Who needs the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome the sin in their life, the habits in their lives? Who needs the power of the Holy Spirit to forgive other people, to forgive parents, forgive family members? Who needs the power to get up in the ways, in the place that they're used to, they just lay, they just give up on the life. They give up. How many People need the power of the Holy Spirit to, to give up the depression that overcame their life. It's only by the power of the Holy Spirit. Young people, once we realize it, <laughs> this world is going to see the true, truth, the true church come into life. Man, how I want that is when our youth would get together and begin to pray in such a, you know, surrender to Christ, pray in spirit. And how the stories, I've heard of stories, people would run up to the building because they would think that the building is on fire. Because there's such a presence of the Holy Spirit that they would notice these people are God's people. They're not no orphans anymore. They're way more stronger than those soldiers with weapons. They're not orphans. Young people, I want to wrap up with you guys can get up I want to read John 13 1 once again it says having loved his own that's you and I who have accepted Christ into our lives having loved you those who are in the world he loved them to the very end now if you're experiencing the loneliness in your life maybe you've been saying man I've been fighting this on my own I've I've even felt that I've prayed to God so many times but he hasn't heard me I feel like I'm in this world on my own maybe depression is overtaking you because you see all the evil around you and you accept, can't accept the light that's shining through I tell you that he loved you and he loved you till the end now you are still living <laughs> that's not the end for you he gave you his spirit Hadima said today he's giving you everything he's given every, you everything for victory as well it's not your strength and it's not your attempt and it's not your trying it's not your wisdom it's the power of the Holy Spirit what we need to do is we need to surrender to him and not only in this service but also when you go back home surrender to him when you begin to have thoughts in your mind when you begin to have temptations coming your way, surrender to him begin to spend the time with him he has the power now he has the power he had the power to raise Jesus from the dead you think he doesn't have the power to raise you up from your situation Now, if you have the Holy Spirit tugging in your heart and saying there's sin in your life, you need to confess it. You need to surrender. You need to give that up. Don't push it away. Don't let it grow even more. Don't push it away. Don't quench the Holy Spirit in this. Now, be willing to leave your old life behind. And I know the scripture tells us that, that He will give you the victory. He will give you the victory and only through the blood of Jesus Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit you will receive what you've been desperate for 
Young people, God has a plan for your life. But it can never be achieved without the power of the Holy Spirit. We need to realize it. As young people, we need to realize it. Because once we do, we're going to become to we're going to start living in our potential highest potential for kingdom of God want us to pray for now and if you have that tug in your heart where God is saying look there's something in your life that you need to give up and it's really important and it, and I, I ask you don't look at the people around you because it is between you and God God has a plan for your personal life And it has to be up to you if you really want that. And if you really want that, surrender it to Him. Confess it. Be willing to leave it. And He knows He's going to help you in it. 